Welcome to your Artsy Girl podcast. I am your host, Christina Carrere. This is a podcast about art, poetry, writing, and anything about creativity. Sit back, relax, and get your dose of brain food to get your creative juices flowing. Welcome to episode 43. Today's featured guest is Suzanne Frischkorn. She is the author of Lit Window Pane, 2008, Girl on a Bridge, 2010, and five other chapbooks. Her honors include the Aldrich Poetry Award for her chapbook, Spring Tide, selected by Mary Oliver, an Emerging Writers Fellowship from the Writers' Center, and an Individual Artist Fellowship from the Connecticut Commission on Culture and Tourism. Everyone, please welcome my next featured guest, Suzanne Frischkorn. Hi, Suzanne. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Christina. Thanks so much for having me. I've known about you and your work for some time now because I, I've lived in Connecticut for a while and I've gotten to know some of the names around. And uh, now that I'm in Florida um, and you've been on my friends list for a long time and you were on my list to call be- for this podcast because I wanted to pick your brains and uh, learn more about you and your work. I'm so flattered and uh, I'm excited <laughs> to be here. <laughs> Great. So you live in Connecticut. Were you born and raised there? I was not. I was actually born in um, Hialeah, Florida. And I, we only actually lived in Florida until I was about five. And then we moved to the Pocono Mountains and okay. we spent a little time there. And then I grew up um, along the Hudson River Valley in New York. Mm. In different mm-hmm. towns around there, and I didn't move to Connecticut until 1990, and I've been here ever since. Just, I don't know. I didn't. It just kind of happened. We don't have family here or anything. We just still here though. <laughs> okay. So tell me, how did you get into writing, and why did you choose to write and publish mainly in poetry? Well, I actually, you know. Um, I fell in love with books at a very early age. I remember being very eager to learn how to read. And uh, so I was reading for a long time and then I wanted to be a writer and, you know, all all through school, that was where I was most, um, I guess, rewarded in Mm -hmm. grades and stuff like that. And I actually went and I was a journalist. So my first publications were in journalism. I was an education reporter. I worked for an alternative weekly. I wrote, you know, essays, stuff like that. And then what I went through, I thought that I would be a fiction writer because that's really mostly what I read and what I was really into. And my, um, I had like this horrible, tragic year in 1993 where all these horrible things happened. And one of them was that my brother passed away. Oh, no. Yeah, it was really hard, hard on me. I was very young. And I started mm-hmm. writing, po- you know, really bad poems <laughs> and uh, about him. And it was really just a way to deal with grief. And then I wanted to share them. And I met this whole community of poets at these, like, open mics and in Fairfield County, basically, Actually, and in primarily Porchester, in Portchester, New York, which okay. is right over the line, and uh, okay. and I got good feedback from them, and then suddenly I wanted to know everything I could ever learn about poetry. I really fell in love with it as an art form, and mm-hmm. I and I love language, and I love words, and word history, and from then on, that was it. All poetry, all the time. Wow! Wow! It's amazing. It's interesting to know that you started off in spoken word primarily um, because I don't see that influence in your work. I mean, I I know that your work is uh, narrative, but it's also lyrical. So who were your earlier influences then? I was very fortunate. I met poets that were really great at spoken word. You know, we'd go to the New York and we had a different Mm -hmm. series and and Porchester was a happening place for artists at that time I didn't I lived in Stanford at that time so it wasn't too far to go over to Porchester for whatever events were going on my friend Michael Dorian was an incredible incredible spoken word artist he's I don't think he does it anymore but he's gone on to direct films and stuff but so he was an influence I was reading a lot of the beats you know, Diane de Prima and, and Bukowski. And it started like that. Then 
I think what changed me was reading Emily Dickinson. Her poem, Mm -hmm. I Would Not Stop for Death, was the first one that everything clicked for me. You know, that first poem that enters you. And then, of course... I went and I bought every book I could about Emily Dickinson. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like interesting. <laughs> you know, your influence is, is the same as mine. It's funny because I was in Connecticut and I started, it was the same time frame, actually. <laughs> um, and I was drawn to the beat poets. I mean, Jack Kerouac, I devoured his yes. work yes. like crazy. And that's how, that was my gateway. And, uh, So, and then build off from there. But yes, it's the same for me in the same area. It's interesting. (laughs) What's interesting is I think spoken word was really, is really like a gateway drug to poetry. It was so. Well, that's a good thing. (laughs) Because, you know, you really learned about sound and performance and all of that. But, and then it's almost like it opens up a door and then you're like, well, you know, why doesn't this work on the page? I want to make it work on the page. You know, I want people to experience this on the page the way I experience it. Okay. Now, my next question is, how did you make it work on the page? Someone recommended a book called Writing Down the Bones to Me. Did you ever read that? Yes, of course. Natalie Goldberg. (laughs) She was so freeing to me. Just write. Just write. Mm -hmm. Don't think. Just write. You know, and um, and then. I had a must have had a really great bookstore. Someone on that in that bookstore was a poet because there were so many. <laughs> I like I was just walking around one day and going through the reference section and I stumbled on a poetry handbook by Mary Oliver. Yeah. And, and it was that opened I still have up, that book. <laughs> I still have it too. It opened up a whole new world to me. You know, she made me think in a totally different way. And then, you know, there was like guide to poetic forms. And I mean, everything was there for me to just stumble on, just Mm -hmm. with no help from anyone. That's also Mm -hmm. where I found um, Adrienne Rich and Sylvia Plath. And that's where I came across the best American poetry, you know, which was it was interesting because I wasn't quite ready for the best American poetry because Mm -hmm. I didn't when I first bought it. The first one, like in 1993, I was like, what is, what is this? I was still very deeply <laughs> into the smoke <laughs> word. And then, but every single one of them had these great essays by people like Robert Bly or Rita Dove. And it was almost like a little mini poetry class, just reading their introductions. It was really fascinating. So you know? you're primarily self-taught then. <laughs> yes, I did even ultimately end up going to like a few workshops Mm -hmm. um, I got to and a retreat where I met some other people and the workshops were interesting because it was the first time prior to this the artists I met were all living living like really bohemian lives they were not you know employed they were waiters or they were you know they weren't they were living the art life, like the very back Kerouac life. <laughs> so, yeah. And then with this, this opened up my eyes as well. When I got to this workshop, they were, they were people that were, uh, you know, very straight and <laughs> they worked as teachers. I was like, you can have a job. You can have a job <laughs> and be a poet. It's really opening eye-opening to me that you didn't have to live this very kind of like existence where you're just basically burning yourself up into this little collating on yourself you know and living this way I wasn't at that I had already had a child so I wasn't living that way I must be clear but my friends around me were Mm -hmm. (laughs) and again yeah you learn you learn to live a double life almost you know (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> that was a totally double life. But at the same time, I was writing book review columns and writing for the newspaper. Yep. I, was, I, mean, I did have a job. I just was surprised to meet so many creative people that were just seemed so normal, you know? <laughs> that sounds awful. Right. I loved no, my friends. But I no, that's a very interesting, because we, we get these misconceptions and, and these stereotypes of how writers right. and artists are. Right. But... Uh, no, we we have to work and we have to support ourselves also. And but yet we can still create, and that's how most of us do. Um, tell me more about your aesthetics and style and your poems. 
that I've read, you, you tie in a lot of nature metaphors and imagery, and it's no wonder that you had an you got an award by Mary Oliver. Can you tell us a little more about that? Mary Oliver, it was so lovely. It was so lovely because I felt like she was a teacher to me just from that handbook. Mm-hmm. And she was judging um, the Aldrich Contemporary Art Museum used to have a national contest where they would pay, select two poets and put them together in one chapbook. So they would be like yes. opposite facing from each other. And mm-hmm. I had been working on this chapbook, Spring Tide, and I sent it in and she picked it. I couldn't know oh, how there was a lot of the natural world in there. And, you know, when I look even from the beginning, there was always um a sense of place in my work, whether it yes. be urban or, or, you know, rural where I am now. And I guess it's something that I, you know, I never really thought of myself as someone who wrote about the natural world. It just felt like the, it just showed up a lot in my work. So. I know, I noticed that um, even when you write about mm, like everyday affairs or uh, relationship issues, but you you have a uh, beautiful way of tying in, you know, the the natural world into it, and which is it's very impressive. Thank so, you. Uh, yeah. On that note, do you have a couple of poems um, and uh, to share with us? And and if you do, please explain a little bit about them. Okay, I do actually. I just happen to have two poems here to share. <laughs> Right. The Great. The poem is from my first book, which is Lit Window Pane. And a little interesting tidbit about this poem is that when it was first published, before it, you know, it got into the book, it was part of um, a Dancing Girl Press project. Which oh my gosh! I know Dancing Girl Press. Yes, <laughs> Christy Bowen. <That's- laughs> I got a, I got a um, chat book published through her. Also, it's great. I think I admire her so much. I think she's I know. I know. Interesting. I did interview yeah, her as well. <laughs> as a poet, as well in her own work, not just. All I got Fever her. Almanac is awesome. She's amazing, right? Mm-hmm. She created this. Uh, this little project, this limited edition, and it was called B.A. Du, and which is French for love letter. And she had poets, you know, she selected the poems and then she had us each make our own kind of creative way of sharing the poem. And she put it in a little box. And it, to this day, it's my favorite way of publication I've ever had because it's just so beautiful, creative way of putting their poems in the little box. There was only, I think, about 15 poets. So that's a way of saying, this is a love poem. (laughs) So it's called Window. A damp windowsill means nothing. It's no bird tapping on a pane. I am waiting for the swallow stone, the anodyne to illness brought by sparrow song. This morning rain gathers in still puddles and the songbirds sing without percussion. Loud notes echo the empty street. They sing and sing and sing. No owl has brushed its wing against our window pane, and sunlight overcomes the clouds. Thrush bird song, lacy throated stars. The April of our fifth year, reeds withered around the pond. Last summer, I painted the porch ceiling robin's egg blue. Spring now and the sparrows weave a nest in our dryer vent. I watch you ladder your way into their world, lift bits of twine and sticks and string, yet you know they will return. How I love you then, how I should have loved you all along. Wow, that's beautiful. I mean, I read that poem and it works wonderfully on the page, but when you read it, oh, it's music. Oh, totally. Oh, oh yeah. And the imagery. You can have me on here anytime. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you very much. <laughs> oh, you have another one? I do. I have one from Girl on a Bridge. Okay. And uh, this one was interesting. This one came kind of whole. And it was, it came after I was reading from my chapbook, Spring Tide. No, no, actually, my, I'm sorry, my chapbook, Red Paper Flower. I'd had a reading the night before, and I don't know what happened during that reading, but it must have brought me back to a time, a different time. And I came home, and I just, you know, one of those 
once in a while they come out like whole. It's not usual, but and it has a um, it has an epigraph, and it's from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Charlie, the scene is where Charlie Sheen, I don't remember his character's name, is sitting in the police station with Ferris's sister. Right. And he looks at her and he says, you wear too much eye makeup. My sister <laughs> wears too much. People think she's okay. a whore. <laughs> so, great lush. Our cornfields were paved in asphalt. Sulfur lights snuffed our stars. When one of us had no shoes, we went barefoot, walking streets laid with tar. First, we coated lashes black as black from tubes of green and pink, our eyes lying coal. If it was Thursday, we found boyfriends and waited by the liquor store for anyone to buy a Smirnoff, anyone at all. We were not sweet girls. We were not sweet girls, yet we wore silver chains with silver hearts and crosses, onyx rings, blush, lipstick, powder, hair flipped by vent brush before entering a night without stars. Our parents were line dancing, were bank tellers, were absent. We were a family that knew nothing about its members. We cut school and watched foxes, we cut school and drank vodka. We cut school and got stoned, did our makeup, walked the streets. One of us got out. One of us ran into our connection working a shoe store. One of us glimpsed another with a baby. One of us marries her Thursday night boyfriend and shatters her image. We were not sweet girls, no. If there had been corn or stars, Maybe the deep, sweet girlness would have surfaced. Dreamy, fresh-faced girls, petals listening to rain. <laughs> it reminds me of my my early adult years in Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> Not your misspent youth. <laughs> no, I, I grew up in in the Philippines in high school. So, but after that. Yeah, after 85 on, that's where I was in Connecticut. So That was yep. definitely 86, 85. I told you we got a lot of parallels <laughs> going on here. <laughs> yeah, so was that a persona poem or is that something that came from personal experience? That came from personal experience around that age, being a teenager, that kind of real close friendship you have at that age where they, you're, you know, where other people become your family. And it's something that really interests me because I didn't realize till I was older that we were all, you know, doing things we really should not have been doing. And right. none of us really were talking about our families, but we all must have come from the same families. Do you know right. what I mean? Right. Because we were all being kind of neglected, benign neglect, you know, it was right. that time. And I think a lot of Gen Xers may have, may have experienced this kind of like a lot of early freedom. You know? That's what it is. You pinpointed it. It is a generational thing, I feel, mm -hmm. because you're right. It's like they were present, but not present to me mm -hmm. from my personal experience. Also, that that really just opened it up for me. I mean, uh, brings home the uh, the reasons why we kind of ran amok at that age. I don't really? know. From, mm -hmm. the, uh, also, the other thing was, I think at that time, too, not only had I read, read, you know, had a reading for Red Paper Flower, but I also had been noticing a lot of, uh, around the time I wrote that, there were a lot of poems about girlhood going around from a different generation. That mm -hmm. was so, they were so sweet. And so lovely. Yeah, right? So, and I was like, that, I did not. That's not our experience. That's not my experience. <laughs> nope. <laughs> you know. That, that poem really struck a nerve because it, it was something I, I deeply connected to because it was my experience as well. So okay. thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Do you create in other genres or art forms by chance? I do not. My biggest claim to fame, I thought about, you know, that because I've listened to some of your podcasts and the biggest thing, the most creative thing I've done is that when my children were younger, when they were in elementary school and they had to brown bag it, I used to draw 
on their brown bags for them. So I would make mm-hmm. chickens and unicorns and they still talk about it. Apparently it was very cool Aww. for them to have, to have an actual, like apparently my drawings were very good to elementary school, their peers. So <laughs> that was about it. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm so happy. I'm like, wow, it's like you never know what's going to stick with them. So I'm glad they have that happy well, memory. You know, it's, it's okay. So being, a, a, you know, mothers uh, who are writers, artists. Now I never thought that, you know, what my passion is in the arts would um, directly influence my children, but it did and it does still because they all have their creative bents. And it's interesting because when I had an art exhibit there in Connecticut, I made sure that I put a piece of artwork of my children with mine. And, and, And to just the other day, my daughter was like, and I remember you put my artwork there with you. <laughs> I was like, oh, yes, I did. <laughs> That's so nice. But I mean, because I, mm-hmm. it's your heart, right? I mean, you right. <laughs> well, I wanted them to be exposed to the arts. And that's another thing. Uh, that's one of my, um, I, I, I hope and I wish that other people would expose their children to the arts at an early age mm-hmm. because it is a, a, a definitely an enriching way to be um, if you can connect with that because um, yeah it's so important yeah you know, unfortunately, you know, they don't really value the arts right now in the United States. But I did yeah. get all of my children through art museums and there you they go. All had access to so many art supplies, all opportunities to be creative. And, mm-hmm. you know, and you can see most, you know, and I would hang up their art. I didn't have an art exhibit, but anything they did would, would be hung up for a while. My whole yes. house was decorated with kid art, but I thought it was wonderful and creative and, you know, perfect. It was very genuine I, yes. and authentic, you know, right, my, right. my desire to hang it and have them be proud of their work, you know, and, right. and I, you know, I think it served them all well. You know, some of them have a love of reading. Some of them have an appreciation for the arts. My daughter is very creative. She's really interested mm-hmm. in photography. Mm-hmm. So I too. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I love, you know, I like, it's almost like making sure that they're aware of theology in some ways, just so they know a little bit about it. So it's mm-hmm. nice to know that they're aware of art and, and, yes. and, and all that. So tell me, what are your current projects and future goals now? Well, I have another manuscript that's out in the world looking for a home. Yeah, that it, this one is a, a little bit different from the other two in some ways. And it has a lot of like texture and layers. And it's also wow. it's like exploring um, like not like identity and not being complete in either culture that I'm in, like ethnic wise. And so I'm not sure. I don't know if it's going to get picked up. I hope it does. I hope other people can. Oh, I'm sure it will. Um, So is it a full length collection or? And, uh, and it's, it was important for me to write, you know, we'll see if other people connect to it. Um, well, you got to say, you submitted it out already, yeah, right? I'm sending it out. And I'm, and I'm also working, it's nice because now that I've been able to let it go, I've been able to create and generate more work. So right. it's almost like, okay, it's out. In the you world. cleared your plate, ready for more. <laughs> right. So I've been working on, you know, furiously working on, on a, on, a bunch of poems that seem to have a thread, but I don't want to think about it too hard because I just want to see where it goes, you know? So, yes. Yes. What's the title of your, your manuscript? The one that's out is called fixed star. Oh, (laughs) nice. (laughs) I love it already. (laughs) I have a penchant for nautical imagery and, uh, cartography, all that. I mean, yeah. so yeah, big star. Love it. So where can people go to learn more about you and your work now? I have a website and it's called suzannefrischgorn.com. 
Um, I think my books are uh, my books are available at the Main Street Rag Bookstore. They're both from Main Street Rag, yes. and if you go to their bookstore and and put in my name, or if you go to my website and click on there's a page with books, and you click on the link, it'll take you directly there. And I think they're on sale. <laughs> Oh, well, Suzanne, it's been great talking to you and learning more about you and your work and finally got a chance to talk to you personally, and which is a treat. So please stay in touch and let me know about that manuscript. Let I me know, know when that's published. Thank you so much. I had so much fun. We should do this. Good. And, and, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> thank you so much. I'm really honored that you asked me and you thought of me because I, I love what you're doing with the podcast. And it's so interesting to see so many different types of art, artists featured. And I'm just proud to be part of it. So thank you. Thank you very much. Good. Oh, you're very welcome. Well, everyone, that is it for now. Please tune in next week for my next featured guest. In the meantime, have a productive and creative week. Bye, Suzanne. Thank you. Bye, Thank Christina. you.